Well, welcome again to Sunday evening. And we're in, uh, I think my, by my count, we, book 61 of 66 books. So after tonight, we'll have five more books, a little bit more than five more weeks. Uh, but we'll be in the book of Second Peter tonight. If you don't have a Bible, um, there'll be some men, a man, walking down the aisles. If you need a Bible, we want to have one in your hands. There might be nobody that needs one. And so tonight, we're going to be looking at the book of 2 Peter. Uh, we looked at 1 Peter last week. This is where we do a one-message overview of a book of the Bible in one night, which means if you have your favorite passage in the book of 2 Peter, we might not cover it. What we really want to do is give you a taste of the book overall so that you can go back on your own uh, with the big picture in mind and then be able to uh, slowly work through the details of the book on your own. I um, want to cover some of the key messages, but maybe not get to each individual passage. Um, but this is a short letter, uh, 61 verses long. Uh, these, this book you can read in about 10 minutes. And a third of the way through this, his letter, Peter will say, But false prophets also rose among the people, just as there will also be false teachers among you. Uh, false teachers would come among Peter's readers, and believers, they will come among us. So the question is, do you believe that you would spot them if they came? How would you identify a false teacher? Well, one symptom of false teachers is that they have false doctrine. They may deny God's existence or teach error about uh, His nature and His attributes. They might deny the Trinity or teach uh, error about Christ's person or the work that he did. They might deny Jesus' virgin birth, his perfection, his substitutionary atonement. They might deny the resurrection or the future coming and reign of Christ. They might also teach error about the person and work of the Holy Spirit or deny the authenticity, authority, or inerrancy of Scripture. And we're familiar with false systems of doctrine who either deny the biblical doctrine of God and the Trinity or advocate a system of works righteousness or both, Mormonism, Unitarianism, Seventh-day Adventism, Roman Catholicism, Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, they, they get doctrine wrong, among other things. But another more subtle symptom of false teachers is the lives they live. When describing false teachers, teachers in 1 Timothy 6.3, Paul writes, if anyone teaches a different doctrine and does not agree with sound words, those of our Lord Jesus Christ, and with the doctrine conforming to godliness, he is conceited, understanding nothing. Well, Paul says sound doctrine, sound words, Jesus' words conforms with, conform with godliness. True doctrine Jesus' doctrine, rightly believed and submitted to, will be accompanied by godliness. And, and so there's just a necessary connection between the doctrine we believe and the lives we lead. And that will be apparent in Second Peter. And so we'll see that false teachers can be identified by both their teaching and their lives. Well, in his second letter, Peter, like Paul did in 1 Timothy, addressed the danger of false teachers. Uh, Peter doesn't give a detailed explanation of the doctrine that these false teachers adhered to, so we can't be certain about what they taught, other than that they seem to deny the future return of Christ to judge the world. But what is more important or more prominent in Peter's discussion about false teachers is their conduct. In a letter warning believers about the dangers of false teaching, Peter is going to spend a significant amount of time addressing the importance of godly conduct for believers, which would be a stark contrast to the conduct of these false teachers. And so an inescapable conclusion of 2 Peter is that there is just a connection between doctrine that we believe and the lives we lead. So I want to look at the purpose of 1 Peter or 2 Peter, I should say, and we'll put that up on the screen in front of you. It's a little bit of a mouthful. We'll read it together, and if you don't have a chance to write it all down now and don't want to go look on the website, I'll put it up a few times tonight so you can fill in your notes as the night goes on. 
But Peter warns believers to not fall prey to the error and ungodly living of false teachers by diligently clinging to and growing in grace and the true knowledge of God so that escaping the coming judgment of the world, they would enter the eternal kingdom of Jesus Christ. There's a lot there, but trying to pick the, some of the key themes of what Peter has been addressing. So I want to, as we dive in tonight, I want to look first about what the author says about himself. What does the author say about himself? And so we'll look at first Peter, or Second Peter 1.1 says, Simon Peter, a slave and apostle of Jesus Christ. He describes himself as a slave. Well, in 1 Peter, he identified himself merely as an apostle of Jesus Christ. But here in 2 Peter, he also says that he is a slave. He doesn't act for himself, but on another's behalf, that of his master and Lord, Jesus Christ. His words bear authority because they come from Jesus. Well, we also will learn about Peter in the book of 2 Peter, if we were to look at verses 14 and 15 of chapter 1, is that Peter will soon die. Peter is in his final days. Uh, we don't know how many days that are, but look at verse 14 of chapter 1. Knowing that the laying aside of my earthly dwelling is imminent, as also our Lord Jesus Christ has indicated to me, and I will also be diligent that at any time after my departure, you will be able to call these things to mind. Jesus has revealed to Peter that he was about to die. If you remember from last week in John 21, Jesus told Peter how he would die. And now apparently Jesus has told him that the time was soon. Peter writes about a time after his coming departure. And his expectation is that his readers will outlast him. And so he longs to build them up before his death. Lastly, as we consider the author and particularly the timing of Peter's writing, is Peter was writing towards the end of his life, likely during the period of persecution under Nero that likely started between the time of his first and second epistles. We can't be certain. And if church tradition is correct, Peter died by crucifixion in Rome sometime before Nero's death, and that would place his second epistle probably um, being written from a Roman prison in the time of AD 67, 68 AD, give or take a few years. So that's the writer. Um, we talked a lot more about his life uh, really before Jesus' resurrection last week. But now let's turn to look at the recipients. Who is Peter writing to? And we, we see immediately by looking at just the second part of verse 1, who he's writing to. To those who have received the same kind of faith as ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Peter is writing to believers. He writes to those who have received faith. And Peter, interestingly, doesn't say to those who place their faith in Jesus Christ, but who received faith. Well, children of God do respond obediently to the gospel and place their faith in Christ. Peter here is highlighting the fact that the very faith that man exercises is given by God. And while it's possible that Peter is actually highlighting the body of doctrine that was been handed over to them as being the faith, the, the emphasis in the next couple of verses seem to emphasize that this is salvation that he's talking about when he says the faith, not just a body of doctrine. And that's especially true in the next phase phrase, notice the, the means of this faith that they received. How did it come to them? From what source? By the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. The, the righteousness of Jesus, who is in one person, both God and Savior, divine and human, his saving righteousness was the source from where the gift of faith came. Believer, our salvation, our faith is a gift from God. We're saved not because we are righteous, but because God is righteous. Because Jesus is righteous and he gives us faith. And something that's just astonishing about this verse in particular, while scripture clearly teaches the deity of Christ, 
Scripture rarely uses the title God to explicitly refer to Jesus Christ. It's far more common for the New Testament to use the term Lord, especially when quoting the Greek Old Testament. Lord is frequently a clear reference in those quotes to Jesus as Yahweh. Sometimes he's called the Word, but to explicitly call Jesus God is rare in the New Testament. But 2 Peter 1.1 is one of those places. The grammar is not as obvious in English, but the underlying grammar is uncontestable. The the righteousness which belongs to God is the same righteousness which belongs to our Savior. But more than that, our God and Savior refer to the same person, and that person is then defined, Jesus Christ. So in verse 1, Jesus Christ is both God and Savior. So here in this verse, we have Jesus, the focus of Jesus' full possession of the divine essence. He is God, but at the same time, he is also the man, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Well, let's look to verse 2, chapter 1. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the full knowledge of God and of, our, and of Jesus our Lord. Peter's Peter prays for his readers who have already experienced God's grace when God granted them faith because of Jesus' righteousness. But now he prays for that same grace, the unmerited favor and kindness of God, and their peace with God to, to multiply. Multiply grace and peace. God's grace and peace were not exhausted at their salvation, but Peter longs to see it increase all the more in their lives. And how will grace be further multiplied in the lives of his readers? In the full knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. This is Peter's first reference to knowledge in his epistle, and it will be by no means the last. Actually, knowledge is a key word and idea in the book of Second Peter. And so as you read Second Peter, hopefully this week, just take note of every time Peter uses the word knowledge, as well as words associated with knowledge, such as know or known or remember, call these things to mind. I, I am reminding you. This is a reminder, not forgetting, stirring up your mind, just the continued focus on what believers are to know and what the false teachers do not know. But this knowledge is a knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Just as certainly as God and Savior refer to one person in verse 1, God and Jesus in verse 2 clearly refer to two distinct persons. So in this short introduction, we have both an affirmation of the deity of Christ in verse 1, who, while still being our very human Savior, was God himself. But in verse 2, we also see the distinction of persons between God the Father and God the Son. So just just a detail that's just exciting to see as you look at the details. But in summary, who is Peter writing to? He's writing to believers. Believers who have received faith and grace and peace from God and who know God, who know Jesus our Lord. Well, what else do these believers, do we know about these believers that Peter is writing to? Well, look at verse 12, chapter 1. These believers are established in the truth. Let me read verse 12. Therefore, I will always be ready to remind you of these things, even though you already know them and have been strengthened in the truth which is present with you. Peter's readers already knew the truths that he was putting in front of them. They had been strengthened by that very truth. And they hadn't abandoned it. Abandoned it. Notice that it was still present in them. But Peter knows the very real danger of apostasy, of forsaking Christ. And so Peter's readers, like us, need to be reminded of the same old truths that we know that we are prone to forget. We, we see that reality in Peter's warning in verse 5, warning about the professor of faith in Christ who doesn't exhibit godliness in his personal life. Uh, look at verse 9. For in whom these things are not present, that one is blind, being nearsighted, having forgotten the purification from his former sins. And aren't we just like that? 
How quickly do we forget our forgiveness from sin? How quickly do we forget God's instructions for us that are designed to protect us? We forget his transforming grace. And Peter knows his readers, established as they are, need to be reminded of the same truths that they already know, and so do we. Another thing we know about these believers is, they were, is that they were familiar with the Old Testament. Chapter 2 contains multiple quotations and allusions to the Old Testament. Genesis, fallen angels, Noah, Sodom and Gomorrah, Lot, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the book of Proverbs. And Peter just assumes a knowledge of these by his readers, just as he did in 1 Peter. We also see that these readers are also familiar with some of the Apostle Paul's writings. Um, chapter 3, verse 15 and 16, we'll see him talk about the scripture that they know with, that has been twisted, that's from the Apostle Paul. And, and perhaps more instructively, in chapter 3, verse 1, we learn that these believers are familiar with Peter's prior letter. Chapter 3, verse 1 says, This is now, beloved, the second letter I'm writing to you, in which I am stirring you up, stirring you up your sincere mind by the way of reminder. This is most likely a reference to 1 Peter, meaning that the primary audience of 2 Peter was likely the same as that of 1 Peter. Scattered believers of the diaspora and Asia Minor uh, most likely Jewish, which would be consistent with Peter assuming knowledge of seemingly obscure portions of the Old Testament in both First and Second Peter. But whether these books were originally for Jewish Christians, like the book of James, or for Gentiles or both, the message is applicable to all believers, both in the first century and today. And, and we can see, even in the opening, this broader audience that Peter has in mind, to all who have received the same kind of faith as ours. Peter may have sent his message to a particular group of believers, but these words in 2 Peter are for all of us who know Jesus Christ. Peter's readers had been exhorted to stand firm in suffering in 1 Peter, and now in his second epistle, the primary threat he is concerned about is for them is the threat of false teaching. And his readers must continue to give attention to their conduct in Christ so that they will not be drawn away by false teaching. So I want to look at, put the purpose up in front of us one more time. Peter warns believers to not fall prey to the error and ungodly living of false teachers by diligently clinging to and growing in grace and the true knowledge of God so that escaping the coming judgment on the world, they would enter the eternal kingdom of Jesus Christ. It's been talked about kingdom anticipation this morning. It's in 2 Peter as well. Well, with that, we'll jump into an outline, kind of walk through the book in order. We won't hit all the passages this evening. But we'll start with the certain end of transforming grace. The certain end of transforming grace. Let's start reading in verse 2. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the full knowledge of God and of, our, of Jesus our Lord, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the full knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. For by these he has granted us his precious and magnificent promises, so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. What is the intended effect of grace in the believer's life? What is the ultimate end to which God's work of grace in your life is leading to? Verse 4, so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature. We are, we are born with a sinful, depraved nature. We need to look no further than chapter 2 for this depiction of what we were by nature. That's demonstrated by the false prophets. But God acted in our life. He showed grace upon us, and grace continues to operate in, in us. And the trajectory of grace in our life is that we become sharers of the divine nature. 
Not that we become God, as false, some false religions would teach, but our trajectory is sinless perfection without sin. Is this still future? Yes. We know that we still possess sin, but one day we will be completely free of it when we see Christ at his return or when we go to be with him. We will be free from sin. But is this only future? In some sense, we have already escaped the corruption of the world and its lust. But this is also present. As we grow in Christ, as we become more and more like Christ, the work isn't finished, but it's started. It started in our lives by grace. And for all those who have truly experienced the saving grace of God in their lives, through the true knowledge of Jesus, the end of grace in our lives is conformity to Christ. So what does that look like now? As we live this life, we are increasingly conformed to the image of Christ. We continue to grow in godliness until we finally attain it when we see Jesus. Well, looking to verse 3, notice how well we are provisioned for that very growth. Verse 3 of chapter 1, his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness. We've been given everything we need to grow. Sometimes as I look at my own life and I think, this, this, this is difficult, this sin is too, too entrenched. Can I actually overcome this? Not alone. But God has actually given us everything we need to overcome temptation and sin in this life through his son, through his provision. We don't need to wait until the next life to live godly lives. We are equipped now if we're in Christ. If he saved us, he's promised that we will be sharers in his nature and he's promised that we've been given everything that we need to grow in that, in this life. Next, we look to the certain fruit of growth in Christ, the certain fruit of growth in Christ, beginning in verse 5, Peter will summon his readers to lead a life of diligence, of godliness. But verses 3 through 4 remind us that a life of godliness is rooted and dependent on God's grace, the one who gives faith. Believers live in a way that pleases God because Christ has given us everything we need. Let's keep reading in verse 5, chapter 1. Now, for this very reason also, applying all diligence in your faith, supply moral excellence, and in your moral excellence, knowledge, and in your knowledge, self-control, and in your self-control, perseverance, and in your perseverance, godliness, and in your godliness, brotherly kindness, and in your brotherly kindness, love. For if these things are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the full knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Based on the provisions of God's grace and the intended end of God's grace, Peter urges believers to apply all diligence in pursuing godly character. The message is for everyone who has received faith from God. And notice then everything that flows out of that faith in verse 5. Moral excellence, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness, love spring out of a saving faith. And we shouldn't see these as a logical progression, such as let me work on moral excellence before I grow in knowledge. And then after that, I'll work on self-control. And then I'll work on love last once I have everything else down because it's last on the list. No, that's not Peter's point. What Peter is saying, rather, is that all of these things flow out of genuine faith. And you who have faith are to pursue all of them diligently. That word diligence describes action, speed, eagerness, an earnestness, a zeal. Well, how much diligence, you say? How much effort should be applied to go after these things? Peter says all diligence, all effort. Take pains, don't give up. Make your primary pursuit growth in godliness. Don't leave anything at the table. Don't leave anything in the tank. All diligence. Do we live like that? 
What goals and pursuits do you have in your life? Maybe it's your professional life, your athletic life, your financial life. How much energy do you commit to consider those goals? Are you diligent with your savings, your budgeting, your exercise and diet regimen? Your job, are you diligent to plan for retirement? How about growth in godliness? Are you extending all diligence? Now, it's important to say that we can't muster up this growth in ourselves. God must produce the growth, but he has given you faith and he has given you everything you need for that growth. And he is actually committed to that growth. And in your part is to apply all diligence. Growth in godliness takes human effort dependent upon grace. Human effort and diligence and growth isn't opposed to grace, but rather it is enabled by grace. Just listen to Peter's final command in this book. 2 Peter 3, verse 18. But grow. And we know Peter's means for growth, diligent effort, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We need to grow in godliness, but it only comes through grace and in knowing Jesus, our Savior. But what does growth look like? Let's turn back to chapter 1. Chapter 1, verse 8. And this is front-loaded. We'll be in chapter 1, a good portion of the evening. We'll get to chapter 2 and 3, I promise. Chapter 1, verse 8. For if these things are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the full knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Growth doesn't look like instantaneous, perfect godliness. Of course not. We'd, we'll never be completely free of sin until we see Jesus, but there should be growth. True believers, as a result of this grace-fueled, prayer-soaked, spirit-enabled effort, should see increasing godliness in their self-control, in their brotherly kindness, in their love, in their perseverance, and even in their knowledge. Go after all of them, and growth in each area will actually produce further growth than the others. They're interdependent, and, and we have the promise that the one who is growing in these areas is both fruitful and useful. But what if you claim Christ, and you don't see these things operating in your life? You're not growing. In fact, these qualities aren't even present in your life. Well, let's look again to verse 9. For in whom these things are not present, that one is blind, being nearsighted, having forgotten the purification from his former sins. Genuine believers might go through seasons of life where the fruit isn't as plentiful and the growth isn't as obvious or consistent. But if you claim Christ and you are clearly not living consistent with your profession, you aren't remembering the truth, you're turning back to your sin then Peter's concern is that you might not actually be in Christ. And we can see that in verse 10. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to make your calling and choosing sure. For in doing these things, you will never stumble. For in this way, the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, will be abundantly supplied to you. There's that kingdom expectation. Who is it for? Well, if your faith is genuine, then your salvation can never be lost. But there is such a thing as a useless faith. And when professing believers look at their lives and they see no pattern of growth in godliness, when they see no fruit of being transformed increasingly into the image of Christ, what do we lose? Any ground for our assurance. We have no basis to be assured of our present state before the Lord when we don't see evidence of God working in our lives. But if you've already trusted in Christ alone for salvation, not your own works, but Jesus' righteousness, his substitutionary payment for your sin, and, and you want assurance of that salvation, then pursue godliness. By God's appointed means and by his gracious provision, and in doing so, as verse 10 says, you will be making 
sure your calling and choosing. Assurance of salvation doesn't come from looking back to when you signed a card or when you walked an aisle or said a prayer or were baptized. Of course, you must have actually repented and turned to Christ, but the assurance comes from the resulting fruit, the resulting fruit of growth in Christ. Does your life demonstrate that grace is at work in your life? Do you see that work happening day by day in your life? Then you have every reason to be confident and assured of your salvation. Well, in verse 12, Peter turns to the certain knowledge of Christ's return. The certain knowledge of Christ's return. He reminds us that what has already strengthened them thus far in their walk with Christ, verse 12, therefore I will always be ready to remind you of these things even though you already know them and have been strengthened in the truth which is present with you. I consider it right as long as I am in this earthly dwelling to stir you up by way of reminder. And then the end of verse 15, after my departure, you'll be able to recall these things. Believers are strengthened in the truth. They need to remember the truth, be reminded of the truth. And this is how they will be strengthened for growth. This is what will fuel their diligent pursuit of godliness. And if, in case there is any doubt what truth Peter had in mind, he gets more specific. In verse 16, he says, For we did not make known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, following cleverly devised myths. And if you're like me, you know how many times I've read that. What, what do we think of when we think of the coming of Christ? Right? Peter is talking about the coming of Christ in power and glory. He says, For we did not make to you known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ following cleverly devised myths. We have this first hint of the doctrinal error of the false teachers, and it concerned the second coming of Christ. Peter says, When we taught you previously about the future coming of Jesus Christ in power, we weren't making up myths like the false teachers. We only spoke that which was true. Verse 16 continues, but being eyewitnesses of his majesty, for when he received honor and glory from God the Father, such an utterance as this was made to him by the majestic glory. This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. And we ourselves heard this utterance made from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. Peter defends the truthfulness of the apostles' teaching of the future coming in glory and power of Christ by describing his own time on the Mount of Transfiguration when he actually saw Jesus transformed in glory before him. And at first glance, it might seem strange to verify the truth of Christ's future coming in glory by pointing back to the Transfiguration. But we should remember that Matthew and Mark and Luke all place the transfiguration immediately after the declaration of God's kingdom coming in power that would be witnessed by those standing before him before he died. The transfiguration then anticipates Christ's powerful, glorious coming. And Peter recalls it because it anticipates Christ's glory when he returns. And the eyewitness character of the event demonstrates that Peter was not dreaming or propounding some myth. He saw Jesus transformed. He heard God's word, even a preview of the future glory in which Jesus would one day return. Clearly, they should listen to Peter's message about the return of Christ. But more than that, they should believe Scripture. Look at verse 19. And we have as more sure the prophetic word to which you do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. More than our wit eyewitness testimony, Peter says, is that we have the prophetic word. God spoke through the prophets, predicting the return of Christ in power and glory. Peter may have all of the Old Testament scriptures in mind that spoke time after time of the future coming of the Messiah in power and glory, but more than that, Peter's eyewitness testimony is 
testimony of the Old Testament scriptures themselves. I, I think there actually might be something more going on here about why Peter chose the transfiguration account to defend this truthfulness of Christ's future return. Listen as I read from Isaiah 42. Isaiah 42, 1 says, Behold, my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom my soul is well pleased. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. Isaiah 42, 1 spoke of the coming servant, the Messiah, in whom the Father is well pleased, whom God will pour out his spirit upon and who will bring forth justice to the nations. The passage is all about the second coming of the Messiah in judgment. Listen to that first part again. Behold, my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one whom my soul is well pleased. And what did God say from heaven about the same servant on the Mount of Transfiguration as Peter records it? This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Sound familiar? God himself in a voice from heaven likely connected Jesus' transfiguration to an Old Testament prophecy of his servant coming in judgment, proving the reliability and trustworthiness of the scriptures. So when Peter, even when Peter recalls his own eyewitness experience, even that was simply an experience of God's proclamation of the trustworthiness of his own word when he actually refers to the Old Testament prophecy of Christ's coming. Peter doesn't base the truthfulness of his words based upon his own experience, but upon Scripture, upon Old Testament Scripture. And that's why he says we have the more sure the prophetic word. God's word is trustworthy. Scripture alone is the knowledge that you must cling to, by which you can grow, by which you can know for certain that the Lord is coming again, that his day is coming, that the day of the Lord is coming. And in verse 20, Peter says, it's not even my word about Scripture that you should believe, because God said it, says it is true. Look at verse 20 of chapter 1. Know this first of all. No prophecy of Scripture comes by one's own interpretation, for no prophecy was ever made by the will of man, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. We can trust God's word because it's not man's message. It's God's. Peter was just a slave, sharing his master's message. The prophets, too, didn't share their own message, but spoke from God. Believer, we've been given everything we need pertaining to life and godliness in the gracious, sufficient, unfailing, trustworthy word of God. We can believe it. Well, next in chapter 2, Peter turns to the certain rise and certain judgment of ignorant men. In chapter 1, we saw Peter's emphasis on the grace that transforms the godly life that brings certainty of one's salvation and the certainty of the future return of Christ founded upon the certain truth of God's word. Well, in chapter 2, we see this devastating portrait of those who once heard the truth had a knowledge of the truth, maybe even made a profession of the truth, but did not submit themselves under that truth. They didn't cling to it. They didn't submit to the Lord as master. They didn't experience the transforming grace of Christ. And then straying from the truth, their lives would only evidence their continuing enslavement to and corruption to the world and its lusts. So chapter 2 then serves as a warning for believers to not fall prey to this ungodly living, the ungodly living of these false teachers. And that would just underscore the importance of what he said in chapter 1 of tethering themselves to the word of God and living transformed lives. Well, let's read the opening of chapter 2. But false prophets also rose among the people, just as there will be also false teachers among you who will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing swift judgment upon themselves, swift destruction upon themselves, sorry, and many will follow their sensuality, and because of them, the way of the truth will be maligned. And in their greed, they will exploit you with false words, their judgment from long ago is not idle, 
and their destruction is not asleep. Just as false prophets arose among the Old Testament prophets, so also will men will rise up among Peter's readers who will secretly introduce destructive perversions of the truth. False knowledge. They will come, they'll gain an audience, they'll introduce poison, and it won't be obvious at first, but it'll be done in secret. They'll look like they're saying what is good, but they're actually enemies of the truth, maligners of the truth. And in verse 4 through 8 of chapter 2, we see more promises of the certainty of their judgment. And then in verse 9, we see the righteous judge. Chapter 2, verse 9. Then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trial and to keep the unrighteous under punishment for the day of judgment. If you took verse 9 and inserted it almost anywhere into the book of 1 Peter, it would be at home. Uh, what a great summary of God's ability to, to rescue his godly ones out of the affliction of others and to actually judge sin. But in 1 Peter, the emphasis was not sinning in, re, um, in response to the, I'm sorry, in 1 Peter, the, the emphasis was sinning in response to those who sin against you and not to do it because you know that God's judgment is coming upon those who afflict you. But here Peter's concern is for believers not to be lured into participating in the sin of the false teachers in their sin and error, knowing that God's judgment on them is coming. Judgment is coming, and God knows how to rescue his people. And then beginning in verse 12, Peter will further expose the character of the false teachers. Let's read in verse 12, Chapter 2, but these, like unreasoning animals born as creatures of instinct to be captured and killed, blaspheming where they have no knowledge, will in the destruction of those creatures also be destroyed, suffering unrighteousness as the wages of their unrighteousness. Considering it a pleasure to revel in the daytime, they are stains and blemishes, reveling in their deceptions as they feast with you having eyes full of adultery and unceasing sin, enticing unstable souls, having a heart trained in greed. They are accursed children, forsaking the right way. They have gone astray, having followed the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. These false teachers have turn from the truth. They've gone astray. They're blinded by their love of sin. They have no true knowledge. They love their deceptions, and they'll be destroyed. And this is who we are by nature, but for God's transforming grace in our lives. Amen? Well, in verse 18, we then see the false teacher's tactics at work. Verse 18 of chapter 2 says, For speaking out arrogant words of vanity, they entice by sensual lusts of the flesh those who barely escape from the ones who conducted themselves in error, promising them freedom while they themselves are slaves of corruption. For by what a man is overcome, by that he is enslaved. In their love of sin, they, false teachers will seek to entice believers to their false way, don't worry about being diligent. Don't worry about obedience and all those rules. Be free. Come follow us. Get rid of your, those shackles of Christ and obedience, those shackles of diligence and a godly life. Come be free with us. But the freedom they promise is slavery. And it will destroy. They believe they are free, but they're enslaved by their sin. And anyone who follows after them will be destroyed by their own sin. Believers, don't stray from the truth. Don't follow after them. Don't follow after their teaching. Don't follow after their conduct. Cling to fidelity to Christ and his word. Be diligent. Our only freedom is actually in Christ. After warning his readers of the devastating consequences following after the false teachers, Peter returns again to the truth that these false teachers so malign, eh? the certainty of the future return of Christ and the day of the Lord and judgment of sin. Of course these false teachers reject that. 
So number five, we look at the certain reality of the coming day. The certain reality of the coming day. Look at chapter three, verse one. This is now, beloved, the second letter I'm writing to you in which I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the words spoken beforehand by the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior spoken by your apostles. Knowing this, first of all, that in the last days mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lusts, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. For when they maintain this, it escapes their notice that by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and by water through which the world at that time was destroyed being deluged with water. But by his word, the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and the destruction of ungodly men. The false prophets denied the day of the Lord. They denied judgment was coming. Where was God? I don't see him. Generation after generation has come and gone. And God hasn't come back. He hasn't judged sin. Believer, that day is coming. The unbelievers of Noah's day mocked him. They didn't believe judgment was coming, and God destroyed that world with water. And just like the destruction in that day, judgment and destruction are coming to the present earth, and this time by fire. But what are we to think of the, of the fact that Christ hasn't returned to judge the world yet after 2,000 years since he left? What should we think? Oh, how patient is our God? He's given us more time to repent. He's given you more time to repent. Chapter 3, verse 9, The Lord is not slow about His promise, as some consider slowness, but is patient toward you, not willing for any to perish, but all to come to repentance. But the day is coming, rest assured, and it will come when the people of this world aren't expecting it. Why is this truth so important for believers? Because it shapes the way we live. Verse 11 of chapter 3. Somebody read it this morning. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? Looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens burning will be destroyed, and the elements will melt with intense heat. But according to his promise, we are looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. The coming day of the Lord should have a profound effect on us. Are we looking for that day of the Lord? Well, if we're outside of Christ, it means judgment. But for those in Christ, it is his promise. That, that precious and magnificent promise, Jesus is coming back, and when he comes, we'll be rescued will be like him and will dwell with him forever. In his closing paragraph, Peter returns again to wrap it up to the necessity of diligence in this life. When he comes, will you be found walking in godliness, sustained by his grace, strengthened by truth? Here's Peter's closing instructions to you, believer. Verse 4 of chapter 3. Therefore, beloved... Since you are looking for these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, spotless and blameless. How? Verse 17. You therefore, knowing this beforehand, be on your guard, lest you, having been carried away by the error of unprincipled men, fall from your own steadfastness. But... Grow in grace. Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To summarize Peter's message for believers, remember, be diligent, beware, 
and be growing, grow in grace, grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're not in Christ today, if you're not, if you don't know Christ in this way, what's the takeaway for you? Future judgment is coming. And it's going to come when you don't expect it. And Christ may return tomorrow or you might die on your way home tonight. But the fact that you are still sitting here tonight demonstrates that today God is patient with you. Chapter 3, verse 15 says, Consider the patience of our Lord as salvation. If God is patient with you today, demonstrate by the fact that you're still sitting here, salvation is still available. He's giving, God has been patient with you. He's given you time to repent. Don't presume upon his patience a day longer. You don't know when it will be too late. There is a rescue that is from this coming judgment that is available to all of those who are found in Jesus Christ. Put your faith in him. A reminder of the purpose, one last time, Peter warns believers not to fall prey to the error and ungodly living of false teachers by diligently clinging to and growing in the grace and the true knowledge of God so that escaping the coming judgment in the world, they would enter the eternal kingdom of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you that your sense of time is not our sense of time. When we might wonder, Lord, how, when are you going to return? How long must we wait? You tell us, Lord, a day with you is like a thousand years. A thousand years is one day. Lord, you don't see time and experience it like we do. And that means that there was time enough for each one of us who were in Christ to repent. When we received faith from you, you drew us to yourself and caused us to be born again. You forgave our sin. Lord, may we go out from here and we be diligent to cling to the truth, to be diligent to depend and seek for the end for which grace is pointing, and that is conformity to the image of your Son. Lord, may we grow in godliness, and may, as we see you working in our lives to grow us in godliness, may that increase our insurance, our assurance of our future, and our hope in you. In your name we pray. Amen.